of you are glad that there is nothing impossible with the God that we serve. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you and we worship you, Lord, that you are a God of great things, of impossible things. Even when our situations seem dim, even when we're in those valleys and we don't see a way out, God, I'm thankful that I serve a creator who has everything in his hand. Lord, that you strengthen us when we feel like we can't carry on. Lord, that you're even there to hold us and carry us through those dark and, and trying times. Father, we believe and we declare that you are great, that you are mighty, Lord, in this place. God, in our lives, you are great. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You give a light. You are love.
Thank you for peace, Lord, that passes all understanding. God, I thank you, Lord, for your presence in this place this morning. Father, we just worship you. We love you.
Let's lift our hands in his presence. Would you just lift your hands, open your hearts in the presence of the Lord? You know, when I think about the holiness of the Lord and I know and understand his holiness, it helps me to understand how much I need him. But his holiness, his holiness does not repel us and make us feel like we can't come. His holiness draws us in. Would you open your heart to him and just let him cleanse you? Let him strengthen you today. Let him touch you. Father, in the name that's above every name, Lord Jesus, just as you were here physically on this earth and people love to be in your presence, Lord, may we right now realize how much you draw us to yourself and may we enjoy and love to be in your presence that we can extol you and honor you and glorify you. And also, Father, that we might receive our needs met according to your grace and your mercy. You are on the throne this morning. You're in sovereign control, and yet your, your throne is a throne of grace. And you said that we could come with confidence before you, before your throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. I pray for your people and the people that might be on the screen this morning who are in need of prayer. And I'm asking, Lord, as we come before that throne, that's not only a throne of great power and authority, but a throne of grace that welcomes us to show us mercy and give us grace to give us strength and help and assurance and healing and salvation in whatever we may need. Thank you for it. We receive you. We receive your work of grace right now in our hearts, and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Now, just thank the Lord personally, would you? I think sometimes we, we don't do that enough. Just give the Lord the thanks and the praise and prayer that he is worthy of. Lord, we do thank you for every blessing, especially, Lord, that we are in Christ and we have you with us today in our hearts and in our lives to guide us, to lead us in every step we take. And we praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hey, just turn around, and I don't know if you want to give people an air hug or, you know, the Braves do this right now when they're coming around home plate after they've scored. But God bless you. Good to see you today. Boy, you're looking good in this service today. And uh, may the Lord bless you is our prayer. Glad to have all of you today. Appreciate the worship this morning. Appreciate our worship team. And it's good to be in the presence of the Lord with you. You know, the Lord is doing some wonderful things for us. And um, as you notice uh, the graphic on the screen, three ways to give. And we have an offering plate set up as in the foyer as you leave to give tithe and offering, but also you can give online. And uh, we sometimes fail to talk about how the Lord is using you and blessing through you, through your giving. And uh, so this is in your bulletin, but it's not in the video announcements this morning. But on Sunday, October the 18th, it's a great day because we're going to have an open house. And uh, hopefully and prayerfully, we think we're going to have everything ready for you to go in from 9.30 that morning till, until 10.15, 9.30 till 10.15, and you can tour our children's wings. We've made a lot of upgrades, and we're making a lot of upgrades there. There'll be some new signage and uh, things that we're doing to make our children's wing uh, so inviting for families and children to come in our, in our kids' central uh, area as well. And we just want to celebrate the goodness of God and the way he's used your tithing offerings uh, here at your church. You're so faithful to give, and I want you to see that. And then that Sunday morning, for the first time uh, on Sunday, October the 18th, the Lord willing, we're going to go back to one service. You're going to hear this a lot, see it on, on social media, and you're also going to get it in the mail through cards. But in that open house Sunday, we're going to go back to one service at 1030. It's a brand new time that we're going to start worshiping. And um, not that we're in a hurry when we start at 11, but we just kind of want to just uh, give ourselves some more time in our Sunday morning worship. So we're going to start at 1030 uh, going forward. So uh, keep those dates in mind, that date in mind, and also some upcoming dates as well that you'll want to uh, be a part of. Hey, it's good to have you today. It's good to be with you. How many of you sense the presence of God in this place? Man, I'm so glad I can. You know, his presence is a fact. Uh, it's, it's a reality. But how many of you know that you can experience his presence? Now, let me ask you, how many of you experienced his presence today? I did too, and I'm so glad that I can trust him. 
I'm going to turn our attention to the screen today, and you can uh, be filled in on the things we've got coming up here at the church over the next few weeks. Good morning, and welcome to the Vidalia Church of God. We are glad that you have chosen to worship with us today. Let's stop just a minute and look at the announcements for the week. It's Kids Central time today at 5. All pre-K through 5th grade kids join Emily Page today at 5 o'clock on Zoom. Kids Church, just for you. It's Student Night, Wednesday night at 6.30 in the Smith Center. Make plans to join Pastor Brandy this week. By day of Church of God family, you are invited to Open House Sunday, October the 18th. 9.30 a.m. to 10.15. Come see the many improvements made in our children's wing, and afterwards we'll have morning worship beginning at 10.30 in the sanctuary. It's time for pastor's council elections. A church conference is scheduled for Sunday night, October the 18th at 6 p.m. Make plans to come and vote for one of the very important leadership roles within our church. Those interested in becoming a candidate for Pastor's Council must complete a qualifications form and return to Pastor Merritt. Blank qualification forms are at the Welcome Center for your convenience. Do you know what Relaunch Sunday is? Sure you do. This is the day we relaunch all activities on campus to include life groups at 9.30, worship and children's ministries at 10.30, and also family enrichment night on Wednesday night at 6.30. Welcome back to Campus Life. We have missed you. In your prayer time this week, remember the ones on our prayer list that God's healing hands will touch them as only He can. You can stay up to date with all of our church events by following our social media platforms. Well, those are the announcements for the week, but we want you to know, should you need us, just give Pastor Merritt or the staff a call. I want to start a new message series uh, today, and uh, just entitling it, Choose Joy. And in these messages, I'm going to give you four or five messages, I, I believe, and they're going to be biblical choices that we make to up our joy quotient, to help us to really experience the joy of the Lord as he ex has he's, has uh, given it to us and expects us to enjoy his joy in our lives. Now, sometimes I get the impression that uh, pressures in life come to such an extent that the pressures around us push out the joy of the Lord that is within us. And that can happen when we allow the pressures on the outside to get on the inside of us. And sometimes it's just problems that we're so fixated on. We fixate on the problems more than we do on the promise keeper, the Lord himself. And so that we lose our joy and we allow those problems to rob us of the joy that the Lord has for us. Or maybe it's people. Did you know sometimes we can allow people to stress us out and to cause us and we shouldn't say cause in the sense that we use that as an excuse. But if we don't handle it correctly, instead of praying for them and depending on the Lord to help us navigate through our relationships, sometimes it can really be a joy robber in our lives. You know, when I think about the choice of joy in my life, it helps me to understand that joy is just that. It's a matter of choice and not of circumstance. And I'd like for you to think about that. So many times we equate our joy to, to things that are good in our life right now, but choice, uh, joy is a matter of choice in our life and not circumstances. God does not always remove the pain in our life, but God does give us a joy that is our strength to help us have victory in spite of the battle that we're going through that comes many times to rob us of that very thing. So joy is a matter of choice when we feel like it and when we don't. And I want to say it again, joy is more than a feeling. Joy is a foundation 
of God in our life in which we may stand in our life. Choice, choices lead, but feelings follow. And so I want to encourage you to not get caught in this trap of thinking joy is only if I feel joyful, but we're really talking about a matter of choice because our choices are, will lead us into the victory that we need and it'll lead us into the joyful life that we need. Now, Paul is my go-to person to help me with my joy quotient, to be able to choose joy in my life because this man had an incredible attitude. More so than anybody else other than the Lord Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul uh, epitomizes what it really means to choose joy in your life in spite of circumstances, in spite of people, in spite of situations that are beyond our control. If anyone had an excuse to complain, if anyone had an excuse to lash out or to be mean-spirited at times, it would have been the Apostle Paul. Because we know that in his life, he went through so many things, pressures, as well as physical pain in his life for preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet, the Apostle Paul was able to help us understand how to live this life. This is not just for a saint that's been put in a stained glass window somewhere, but it's uh, lived out in the crucible of life. And it helps us to be able to bring this into our own life and into our own relationships, into our own situation. When I think about his life, I think about how often the Bible says, he says of himself, and matter of fact, the Holy Spirit somehow inspired Paul to write to us about all of the adversities and the issues and the pain that he went through. And it was to help us understand that we're going to go through pain and sorrows too. But many times in his life, he would talk about, well, he was shipwrecked. He was going, he was a prisoner for the preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, shipwrecked on his way to stand trial in Rome. Uh, nobody there to rescue them out in the ocean, and he has to float on a plank to get to this island. When he gets on the island, they build a fire, and he's snake bit uh, there uh, by a viper. So he goes through all of these situations. He talks about in his life how that... Uh, uh, he was beaten five times with the Roman cat of nine tails. And we know that Jesus was beaten with those 39 stripes before he went to the cross. Well, Paul said that he was beaten with that Roman, uh, that Roman cat of nine tails five times. He was beaten with rods. Those rods were, were, um, were flexible kinds of material uh, rods, and, and they would start at, at the back of the calves and just beat the person all the way up. But here is this uh, man in his life, and he is uh, suffering and going through a lot of pain, but yet he maintains this joy. As a matter of fact, and I should have put this verse on the screen, I didn't, but in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he's describing all the things that he goes through. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he makes this statement. He says, sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. And that's where we are sometimes. There are things in our lives that God doesn't take away our sorrow. He doesn't take away our pain in life, but he does give us the rejoicing and the joy that we need that's uh, just in, in unfathomable strength that gives us victory in spite of that. He says, uh, sorrowful yet always rejoicing. Now, that word yet is an important word in Scripture. And uh, matter of fact, I want to preach a whole message on a place called yet, but yet is a very important word because the word yet is a word of perspective. He says, uh, sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Uh, yet is a word of choice. Uh, I'm sorrowful, yet I choose to always rejoice. Uh, I have an acquaintance that I met about five years ago. We were doing uh, some missions work, inner city missions work on uh, the streets of Detroit. He's a basketball coach from South Carolina, and I am friends with him on Facebook. And uh, his son, a few weeks ago, his son was in a tragic automobile accident. And I followed him over the next uh, few days and weeks. And I marveled again at the grace of God. And his son did not make it. They had great hopes. But when they realized there was no brain activities, 
uh, I marveled at the grace of this man and his wife and how that they made a choice even through, and, and this young man was a, was a basketball star at the high school where his dad coached. And, and it was just, it was just, it was heartbreaking. And he talked about in his uh, Facebook messages, he talked about how he was grieving. <laughs> and I wanted to grieve for him, to be honest. But yet in that grief, uh, it, was in, in, it was incredible how that the grace and the strength of the Lord was shining through. Even so much that uh, when he did pass away, he was asking us to pray that his organs, he had, was an organ donor, his son was, could be placed in the right family, in the right people. And, and that happened. And, and he, was, he was in, this, in the midst of, of sorrow that, that would be hard, quite honestly, for me to fathom. Yet we know that the joy of the Lord is there for every one of us. And so I say that to you because it can be very personal in your life. You may be experiencing some sorrow and some pain in your life, but I want to help you this morning uh, uh, increase your joy. And, and some of you that are an example to the rest of us who have gone through some sorrow and pain, thank you so much for allowing the grace of the Lord to shine through your life. Now, the Apostle Paul, he really un uh, unfolds this for us and unwraps it for us in the book of Philippians. In Philippians is a prison letter. That means it was one of four letters that Paul wrote from prison. And he is there as the prisoner of the Lord. He's very careful to let us know that. He's not the prisoner of Rome. He's the prisoner of the Lord. Why? Because he had a choice in his life. A choice that though he's sorrowful at times and through pain at times, he is always rejoicing in his life. And in this uh, letter to the Philippians, unlike the other letters, uh, the scholars call this the letter of joy because, you see, being in prison is not like uh, being in one of our prisons today. And I'm glad they're not harsh, but I've been to Rome and I've seen the Mamertine prison where the Apostle Paul was, uh, was, would spend some time just before he would be executed for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's a dungeon. And these prisoners in Paul's day, they were chained to the wall or either they were chained to a palace guard. And we know that Paul was chained to a palace guard. How would you like to be chained to the Apostle Paul? I'm telling you, those... Those soldiers, those guards, they got an ear full and a heart full. Don't you imagine? But the Apostle Paul, he wrote this letter. And 27 times in the book of Philippians, that's the reason it's called the letter of joy, he uses the word joy or derivative of joy like uh, rejoicing. And I want to just, if you've got your Bibles, I want you to open it to uh, the book of Philippians. If you've got the phone app of Bible on your phone app, uh, open it up. And I'll be looking at an older uh, translation of the NIV this morning as I put these verses up. And so just hang with me this morning in the book of Philippians chapter 4. And I want to open up with that choice to rejoice. And, and that's what Philippians 4 and 4 really says to us. Uh, it, it's not based on your circumstances. You and I know that joy is a fruit of the Spirit. But we got to cultivate that. And if we don't, we can allow things to come in and people to come in and rob us of that joy. But this is what he said rejoice you know Joyce needs to do it again rejoice right uh, you didn't think that was funny a bit did you how, how, how really lame was that rejoice in the Lord always and it's like you, you need to make this continual you need to make this a lifestyle rejoice in the Lord always as though you didn't get it I will say it again rejoice. Then he says, let your gentleness be evident to all. I don't want to be gentle sometimes. You know, I, like Paul, you know, uh, uh, I wonder how he could keep from lashing out or complaining, going through so much for, for the cause of the gospel. But he doesn't do that. He says, I want your gentleness to be evident to to all. How is our gentleness evident to all? The Lord is near. And that's the point this morning. The Lord is near. Now, near to us. And he's the difference maker in my life. And I've got to, I've got to experience his presence, as I already said this morning in the service. But the point is this. He says, the Lord is near. Now, I, the, the, the first choice I'm going to give you today is the most important choice. It's the it's the uh, primary choice that we need to make in our lives. And this is message number one. If we're going to have joy 
in unspeakable in our lives, inexpressible joy, as Peter talks about in his scriptures. If we're going to really experience that, we've got to make the choice, first of all, to pray. And I want you to say this with me as you see it on the screen. Pray first. Before you send that text to that person that blasted you or falsely accused you or said things about you that were not true, pray first. Before you call up the banker and say, hey, I, I'm sinking here in my business or in my finances, pray first. Before you go to the doctor with that unusual sensation that you've been having that may be causing some pain, pray first before you get up in the morning. Pray first. You say, well, pastor, you know, really, I'm, I'm in a hurry. I got to get the kids to school. I got to do this. Well, well, listen, I'm not saying that you've got to be in bed or be on the, your knees beside your bed an hour, but I'm just saying to you, pray first. It can be something as simple as, Father, I, I, just, I just praise your name, just like Jesus taught us to pray. Because I want to tell you that prayer is a relationship, and we need to understand that we're always connected with God. And just like you look over at your spouse and say, good morning, honey, just go ahead and say, well, good morning, Lord, and, and I want you to guide my steps today. And I don't know what this day holds, but Lord, I know that that you're in control and you're holding this day and you promise that the steps of a good person are ordered of the Lord. Whatever you want to pray. It might not even be five minutes, but I will tell you, if it comes from your heart, it's a great step in the right direction to experience joy in your life that day. Before you go to sleep at night, pray first. But the point is, is oftentimes we do everything, everything in our own understanding, in our own ability, and when all that fails, then we pray. Here's the key. Here's the principle. In this first choice of joy, to pray first. Make prayer your first response, not your last resort. Don't send the text. Don't send the email. Don't call the banker first. In other words, let's make prayer our first response. Response. Now, when I look at this connection, this joy prayer connection, you say, well, is, is there really a connection here? Or is this just what you want it to be, Pastor? No, I really see in Scripture, I see a joy prayer connection throughout the Word of God. As a matter of fact, Jesus, on the night before he went to the cross, in John 16 and 24, Jesus said, until now, he said this to his disciples, until now you've not asked anything in my name. You've not prayed. You've not asked anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive. Why? That your joy may be complete or may be full in your translation. And there's this, this principle. If I'm going to rejoice, if I'm going to make a choice to rejoice, I've first got to make the choice to pray. I read in the Old Testament book, and I don't want to take, get, get too far out with too many examples, so I'm going to come back to Paul and his writings here in a minute. But I read in the Old Testament, that Old Testament prophet named Habakkuk. And Habakkuk, the whole book is only three chapters, but it's a prayer service between Habakkuk, the prophet, and God. He's talking to God, and God talks to him. How many of you know if prayer is a relationship, we need to do some listening? And your wife is saying, she's doing this right now. And uh, because we talk to God, we don't listen. And Habakkuk is in a prayer of listening and talking to God. But Habakkuk has this burden on his heart. He is so burdened for his people because they're being so mistreated and they're going through so much uh, nationally. And we look at our world today and we look at what's going on out there and we don't know what the future is going to hold for us politically. And we think about that and we can even worry over that if we go that far with it. But, but the point is Habakkuk is there and he starts talking to God. And God said, hey, look, I'm, I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to bring justice. And then when he hears how God's going to bring justice, he's not real sure about that. But the point is this. He and God are having this prayer service. And you know, when you come to the very end of his prayer, this is the conclusion. And all that they were going through, and all that they were going to go through, this was the conclusion that Habakkuk made. He said, though the fig tree does not bud, though there are no grapes in the vine, 
Though the olive crop fails, though there is no food out in the fields, though the, there's no sheep in the pens or cattle in the stalls, yet, there's that word yet again, that word of perspective, that word of choice. He said, even though all of this is going on and we don't know economically how we're going to do and if we're going to even be able to feed our families, yet in the midst of that, I will rejoice, he said. I will joy in the God of my salvation. He goes into verse 19. He says, for the Lord, sovereign Lord, hallelujah, he will strengthen me. He is my strength. He will cause my feet to be like the feet of deer, and he will cause me to scale the high places of life. How many of you want that in your life? When the fig tree, when the bank account says that, hey, you, you, you know, you don't know if you're going to make it, or the job situation is lending a, a sense that you may get laid off any day, you can say, yeah, I'm going to make a choice in my life. When the worst of circumstances, in the midst of my grief, I'm going to make a I'm going to make a choice, a conscientious choice to rejoice in that. But you've you got to come to prayer. I can't do that. I just can't will myself to be joyful. It's not a feeling. It is a choice. But it starts right there. Here's a sister scripture to Philippians 4 and 4. It's in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. And the apostle Paul says, be joyful always. Here's the connection. Pray continually. Give thanks in every circumstance, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now, having said that, we're going to use Philippians 4 as our outline, and I promise if you will hang with me, these principles are not going to take long, and I'm not trying to undercut the message that the Lord has for us. But if you'll hang here, I believe God will help us. And I want to give you five things here in Philippians 4, using Philippians 4 as the outline, five powerful benefits that will increase your joy when you make the first choice to pray. And here's the first one. Prayer replaces worry. Say that with me. Prayer replaces worry. You know, do you know sometimes we get under that pressure and we allow the pressures on the outside to get on the inside of us and it can push out the joy. The word, the English word worry, that we get our word worry from, that English word means to strangle. And many times we have a choking feeling. We're going through difficulties. We don't know how it's going to turn out. We don't know what's wrong. We, we can't put our finger on it. And we start worrying about that. And oftentimes, I, I'll t just be honest with you, I go into prayer and I'm battling worry. And one of the things, if I can just be transparent, and I, so I can relate to this so well, the Lord is helping me with, I won't say that I've arrived, but the Lord is helping me with to understand, don't worry first. Don't worry about it first. Pray first. Let prayer replace the worry in your life because this is what he says in Philippians 4 and 6, look at it. Here's that joy prayer connection that he, he comes back to in this chapter and in this book. He says, do not be anxious. Do you see that? It means not, don't worry. Don't, don't be strangled and choked out with the pressures of life and the problems of life and the uncertainties of life, things you don't know how it's going to turn out. But don't do that. Do not be anxious about anything. Does anything mean anything? Yes, but in everything by prayer. And I'll come back to the rest of the verse in a moment. But you see, this is, this is what worry does. This is how it robs us of our joy. Worry borrows into the future. That's what worry is. Worry is not a now word. Worry is a future word. Worry is what I'm afraid is going to happen. And I want to tell you, when you borrow worry for the future, you pay enormous interest. It, it's amazing. And, and not only that, you know how many of you have put something on a credit card and uh, you paid for it five times before you got it paid off? You know what I'm talking about. And that's the way worry is. You pay for it now, and then if it does happen, you got to pay for it again. you got to go through those same emotions all over again. So I'm just simply saying to you this morning, prayer replaces worry. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer. Jesus, he taught us about worry so many times. But in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 
He's talking to us about worrying about, you know, material things and worrying about life. And he asked us in Matthew 6 and 27, he said, Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? He's talking about the future. He said, worrying in the now is not going to do anything for your future. You're borrowing on it. And you're robbing the joy of the now. Then he says in verse 34, so do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. He said sufficient or each day has enough trouble of its own. Let's just deal with the now. Let's pray about the now. Let's pray about the situation. That's what we can do. That's a greater reality than worry that might not happen. So prayer first and foremost. And when we pray first, it gives us the strength so if it does happen, we can, we can walk through it. I, I think... I think so many times we, we look at our children, and, and I've, I've heard people say, you know, I, I don't know if I want to have children, or I don't want to bring them into a world like we, we're dealing with. What, what a disparaging thought. You know, my little grandchildren are becoming, actually they'll be coming this week uh, from Colorado, and I'm going to get to spend several times over the month of October, I'll get to spend with them. But what if I just sat around with them, and all I thought about was, Boy, this culture that we're in now is so different. We don't know this America that we love so much. We don't know if it's going to continue to be the America that we grew up under. And uh, we don't even know how things are going to... What if I just sat around and I would lose that joy that I had with them in the present that, no, I can pray for them now. And that's what I do. And that's what I would suggest you do. You put them on the altar. I'm telling you, put your children and put your grandchildren... Bring them before the Lord. You can't worry their future away, but you can pray, and God will put his hand on their lives and bring them into a glorious future, and you can have joy with them in the now. Amen? Just a little side note there. Here's the second, here's the second byproduct of praying first, if you really want to choose joy, and, and that is prayer relinquishes control. Sometimes we never release our needs to the Lord. We're, we're trying to hold on. And we say we've released them. We say we relinquish them. But we're telling God how to do it. We're telling God when to do it. And, uh, you know, it, it's, like, it's like we're wanting to uh, hold the steering wheel and put our foot on the, 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 the gas. And, and God does not operate that way. God is looking for complete trust. He is looking for a complete release of our needs, of our cares over on him. And so Paul deals with this. He, we pick right back up in verse 6 and, and notice what he says about this prayer. He said, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, and that's another key, but we won't go there today. With thanksgiving, present. Everybody shout out present, if you would, just present. I want you to get it. Present. That's an important word here. Because that, that's telling me I need to relinquish control. Re present your request to God. Now, present, that word there, carries the idea that I lay it at the feet of Jesus and I walk away from it. That's what it means. As a matter of fact, one of the great verses that we quote, because it's short and we remember it along with this one, is 1 Peter 5 and 7. And it simply says... Cast all your anxieties on the Lord. I love that. For he cares for you. That word cast, all of your anxieties, simply means to really just throw them over to the Lord. Here, Lord, here are my anxieties. Here's what I've been worrying about. Here are the problems and the people and the pressures of life. And it just really means to cast all of that, throw all of that over on the Lord, for he cares for you. And I love the way that J.B. Phillips translates that verse because it's, it's, such a, it's such a insight for me. He says, you can throw the whole weight of your anxieties upon him for you are his personal concern. 
God's more concerned about you than he is your problem. He's more concerned about you than he is your bank account. You're concerned about the bank account. He owns the cattle of a thousand hills. Amen. He said the silver and the gold is mine. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He's my father. I'm his child. Hallelujah to God. And I can just relinquish all of that over to the Lord. And then he says, and the peace of God, watch this, which transcends all understanding. Beyond, I can't even fathom God's peace in this. We'll guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So here's what we do if we're not careful. Uh, instead of praying, we worry. And so we, prayer for us is just another worry in time. But God doesn't want that. He wants us to replace the worry with prayer. And what, this is what we do. We go in and we give our worry, worries to God and we don't take them out with us. And what we need to do is leave those there and then walk out with the peace of God. That peace, he says, is like a sentinel guarding your hearts and your minds so that you can be full of joy in the midst of it all. You know, that old hymn that most of you know, I think, What a Friend we have in Jesus. Y'all remember that? What a friend. Y'all remember that one verse that says, oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. We're going to have some pain and some sorrow, but oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. See, when I trust the Lord, when I relinquish that control over to him, I can have peace and I can have joy. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to give you a benediction, and this doesn't close the service, but here's a great benediction in Romans 15 and 14 when Paul says, May the God of peace fill you with all joy and peace. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope. And I want to overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I need to ask myself, well, why am I still holding on to it? It's robbing my joy. It's robbing my peace. When do I need to, to continue to hold on to it? I need to replace that worry with prayer, and I need to relinquish control to God and walk away from it and let him have it. It's his problem now. The third thing, the third principle that I see here in Philippians 4 is prayer regulates my thinking because we know that the battle is won right here, Right? It's how we think, and we think faulty stuff, and we think crazy stuff in our lives. And many times it robs us of that joy of the Lord because of, as, uh, as we say sometimes, it's stinking thinking. It's not true. It's not true about you. It's not true about life. It's certainly not lovely. But notice what Paul says here in chapter 4, verse 8, just following down through chapter 4 in this, in this outline. He says, finally, brothers, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think, think on those things. You see, prayer takes me to where God is. And, and I need to focus my eyes of faith on him, and I need to tune my ears in to him in prayer. I need to focus on his greatness and his love and his grace, and he's never going to leave me for forsake me. I need to tune my ears in. But because we're inundated with so much news today, so, so much negative news, so much bias and things that are not true, it, it can get into our psyche. And uh, many times, you know, social media can be a great thing if we use it for the glory of God. It can be one of the worst things to, to get into our minds. And, and we need to focus on the Lord. And that's why Paul again says, he says, if you then are risen with Christ, if you're a new creation, seek those things which are above, where Christ is seated. He says, set your minds on things above, not on the things of the earth. C.S. Lewis said this, aim for heaven and you get earth thrown in. Aim for earth and you get neither. And we can either set our, our affections on the Lord and the goodness of God and the things of God and the way that he blesses, or 
we can just focus on the here and now. And I just, I just want to encourage you. Make a conscientious effort not to allow the immorality, the, the things of this world to get into your mind. I, I think, it's, I think, I think it we're, we're allowing our joy to be stolen from us because of the things that we're thinking. What a, man, a man is what he thinks about all day long, somebody said. And I, I kind of believe that. And I, so I just want to encourage you, if you want joy, pray first, because where do I get this kind of thinking that he talks about in this verse on the screen? I get it through prayer. Number four, prayer will restore my contentment. Because in this consumer age of consumerism, we just more, 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 more. You need this, you need that. This is not good enough. You've got to replace it with this. And we get caught up in this rat race of life, and pretty soon... We've lost our joy because we're, we're so in debt or we're never satisfied. And, and it's so important for us. I, you, you know, we, we could talk about people and, and, and think about people and we just listen to them. And it doesn't matter how big it is and how great it is. And, and, and you know, you, you're sitting there thinking, man, I, I would enjoy this house or I would enjoy uh, you know, your, your, your place. I think I could enjoy that. A rich billionaire went to talk to a friend of mine once. And he sat down in, in a session with him. And he told him, he said, he said, I have so much material wealth. If my descendants will use my wealth and I'm going to leave them wisely, they'll never have to work a day in, uh, again in their life. And then he looked at the pastor that I know, and he said, but why am I so unhappy? And the pastor thought, well, I'd like to try your lifestyle and figure out why you're so unhappy. But we know it doesn't satisfy. Notice what Paul says to us. When I pray, I'm trusting God for all I need. And you know what? Then I realize I have everything I need. Do you really realize that? When you pray, you really realize you have everything you need. Notice what he says in verse 12. I know what it is to be in need. Get this. In an age of prosperity preaching and prosperity gospel type preaching, that if you don't have, you know, the million dollar this and the million dollar that, you're not living in faith. And that's, that's not the gospel. Notice what Paul says. He says, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content. Where did he learn that? He learned it in prayer. He learned it understanding that when he brings his needs to the Lord, he realize, realizes he has everything he needs in the Lord. He said, he said, in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living or in plenty or in want, whether living in plenty or in want, I have learned that secret of contentment. And here is prayer restores my contentment. That's what prayer does. Prayer restores my contentment. We quote it. We know it. We can quote it from memory. The Lord is my shepherd, David said. I shall not want. One translation says, I have everything I need. Do you? I do in him. I have peace and I have joy and I have security and I have significance. I have everything. I have relationships and my relationship to him. Paul would say to Timothy that this is how we need to pray and think. I will not trust in riches, but I will trust him who richly provides us with everything that we need. So prayer restores my contentment. And finally, the fifth, the fifth byproduct of praying in this joy is prayer relies on God. Prayer doesn't rely on my job doesn't rely on my relationships. It doesn't rely on any of that, but prayer relies on God. Notice what Paul says. Notice chapter 4, verse 13. He says, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Maybe the most often published scripture out there on social media and signs and plaques, I can do everything. We opened up the service today singing that. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. 
totally relied upon the Lord, not upon myself. Do you know, to trust means, the old Hebrew word really meant, if we're trusting in the Lord, it means to roll it all over on the Lord. And I've already talked about that. We leave it there. We don't bring it with us. All that care, all of that pressure, we roll it over on him. Easier said than done, but that's why I have to rejoice and rejoice and rejoice and rejoice and come in, into prayer and keep my prayer life as a relationship with the Father, not, not watching the clock how long I prayed, but enjoying his presence and hearing his voice and letting him speak to me. And I don't think God puts a clock on that. I just think when you really get in his presence, you don't want to get leave. You want, you want to experience that joy that can only come from his presence. But Paul didn't stop there. This is the last verse, Philippians 4, 19. Now notice this. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. But notice this. And my God will. Say this after me. I can. My God will. When I understand I can do everything, not in Wayne, but through him, relying on him who gives me strength, the strength of my joy, then my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. This verse is not on the screen, but Proverbs 16 and 20 says, those who trust the Lord will be joyful. Say this after me. Those who trust the Lord will be joyful. I need to trust. Anybody else stand with me? Would you just open your hands to the Lord? I was talking about earlier just presenting your request to the Lord. If you can do this comfortably, at least do it in your heart if you don't want to do it visibly. But as you just lift your hands, could you just see it as an act of, Lord, I'm presenting all my care, all this pressure, all of these problems. Lord, I'm presenting all of my hurt, the people that talked about me. I'm presenting, I'm presenting everything, all my request, everything, Lord, to you in thanksgiving. Every petition that I need from you. Just lift your hands. At least do it mentally if you don't do it physically. Lord, I present it all to you. I, I throw it over on you. I'm going to leave it with you today. Would you do that right now? Say, Lord, I'm just giving it to you. I can't handle it. I'm trusting you with it. I'm trusting you with my life. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Fathers, we stand here with our hands lifted, our hearts open. I pray, God, that we would just cast all of that anxiety, all of that worry. I pray that we would take all of that pressure and all of those problems. We can't figure it out on our own, and we just come to you in prayer today. We acknowledge that you are God, and in the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus Christ, who said on that cross, it is finished. Lord, we receive from you now joy. We receive from you satisfaction and contentment in life. And Father, I pray that if I've been grumpy and grouchy to my family, to my spouse, to others, Lord, let me get to the root of that. And help me, Father, to get to that place that, that, that I've given it all to you. And I, I choose joy today. I choose joy. And I praise you for it. Now, church, would you just, where you're standing, would you just begin to, begin to receive, begin to receive the replacement. Begin to just let the Lord fill you and overflow you right now with peace and joy. It, it's not mine anymore, Lord. I give it to you. Lord, I receive now the fullness of your presence and your peace and your joy in my life. I receive that, Lord. I receive healing. I receive everything that you've promised and you've done for me in Jesus Christ. I receive hope and all that you have for me. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to give you some instruction today before you leave. I know that... Um, I know that you've been seeing the announcements that I'm opening up the sanctuary every Thursday morning from 6 to, eight, six to 7 for prayer, for a men's prayer time. And I understand that you, some of you just impossible for you to be here, and I understand that. 
So we're putting this out on social media. We're also putting it out on the website, a prayer guide. I really felt the Lord touch my heart several weeks ago. Pray first, Wayne. We got an election coming up. Folks, there was a great prayer march yesterday. Two, as a matter of fact, in Washington, D.C. Many, many churches are going into 40 days of prayer between now and the election. It's wonderful, it's wonderful that we do that. How many of you know that God hears and answers? He really does. I, I'm not, I'm not going to worry about this election. I'm not going to worry about my country. country I'm going to take it to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to pray first. And so we're doing that, but we're also praying. we got a prayer guide. We're going to keep that same prayer guide until the election, and then I'll change it up. But um, it's open-ended. Just come when you can. Stay as long as you want to. I'm going to have some coffee. And Brother Michael Keating, bring some of those good donuts of his, Bill's Donuts in. And we have a donut and a cup of coffee together if you got time. If you don't, but wherever you are, on your way to work, Whenever you can, sometime Thursday, would you just agree with us? You can find it on the website. You can find it, the prayer guide on social media. And also, one other thing, I'm starting a prayer team. You know, all of us are to pray. How many of you know all of us are to give? But how many of you know that the Bible says in Romans 7 that there's the gift of giving? And so it is with prayer. All of us are to pray. What I've preached is for every one of us. But some people have a gift and a ministry of intercession. And if that's you... Just like Anna in the temple when Jesus was presented there by Mary and Joseph, she gave herself to prayer. There are people who are gifted at being intercessors. It doesn't make you any less of a Christian if you're not. But if that's you, would you get in touch with me? And what I want to do is we get prayer needs into our church. I'm going to call you or text you, text our team to pray. As, we're, as that information is given to us for us to pray as a church here. I won't be giving you confidential stuff. But the point is this. I want you to pray for me as your pastor and your pastor uh, leader, Pastor Brandy and all of our leaders here too, And because uh, I covet your prayers. I need them. Amen? So if you'll just think about that and, and help me with that, if that's you, please do that. Uh, and the most important prayer you can pray is the prayer of salvation. And that's that joy unspeakable and full of glory. Amen? God bless you. Turn around and wave at some people, would you? Boy, this is a great-looking second service today. God bless your hearts. Now, ushers will kind of give you some guidance on getting out of here. Uh, but uh, God bless you. I love you. Go with Jesus. He's going with you.